Ladies and gentlemen, the following segment of the podcast is presented exclusively by Hillsdale College. For over 175 years, four purposes have defined Hillsdale's mission, learning, character, faith, and freedom. Thank you for listening and my sincere appreciation to our brothers and sisters at Hillsdale for their great sponsorship. He's here. He's here. Now, broadcasting from from the underground command post, deep in the bowels of a hidden bunker, somewhere under the brick and steel of a nondescript building, we've once again made contact with our leader, Mark Levin. Three eight one three eight one one eight seven seven three eight one three eight one one. All right. You know, one of the things that's done a lot on TV and radio is complaining and whining, and uh, of course, talking. So I got to thinking with respect to the uh, to the vaccinations. What can people do about it? If they have a religious objection or if they've already been subjected to the virus and have natural immunity, what can be done apart from drama, apart from threats, apart from destroying people's lives? And I want to start off by saying this. You can sue the hell out of your employer. You can sue the hell out of your employer, depending on your circumstances and the circumstances at that company. First of all, I tried to find a situation where the federal government has ever passed a law mandating the use of vaccinations. I didn't find a single one. I didn't find a single one because that's a state police power, a state police power. Regardless of people arguing, well, you know, the virus is across state lines, that's fine. Do you know why Joe Biden hasn't yet issued a mandate, has turned to OSHA? It's because he doesn't have the authority to issue a national mandate. There is no statutory authority whatsoever. It's never been done. They still have not issued his executive order based on OSHA regulations because it wouldn't pass muster. That's number one. Federal government has no statutory authority, none, to issue a national mandate. So that's number one. Number two, there's an excellent piece that was written by a uh, professor by the name of, I'm looking, Ken Terry, uh, about the Kaiser Family Foundation and what they, they learned, the legality of vaccination mandates. The Kaiser Family Foundation, or KFF, report addressed the broader question of whether COVID-19 vaccination mandates are legal. Which entities can require people to be vaccinated? The federal government's authority to mandate vaccinations of any kind is limited. The Public Health Service Act authorizes the Secretary of Health and Human Services to adopt quarantine and isolation measures to stop the spread of disease among states, but doesn't even mention vaccine mandates. General vaccine mandates <coughs> excuse me, are generally within the purview of state and local governments, with the federal government playing a supporting role. The U.S. Supreme Court upheld a state vaccine mandate over a century ago, the Jacobson case, 1905, but that's based on the state's police power. In that case, a local law, we talked about this a month ago, required all adults to be vaccinated against smallpox during an outbreak. All states today require vaccinations for school attendance, The Supreme Court has endorsed those laws, but those are state laws. Some states also require adults to be vaccinated, but these laws are very limited 
the report said. Current state vaccination laws for adults are focused on health care workers and patients in health care facilities rather than the general population. And these state mandates generally require that the health care workers be offered certain vaccines and some required documentation of employee vaccination status. But the report didn't say that any states require these workers to be vaccinated. This is why so many people are upset. What's being done today has never been done in American history. Has never been done in American history. Period. Now, I want to pull up some other points here that I think are very important. I looked at some other reports and said, professors who are sort of experts in this area. Scott Bomboy is a editor-in-chief of the National Constitution Center. He points out several federal laws allow for vaccine exemptions for employees based on religious beliefs. That would be Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the disability status under Title I of the Americans with Disabilities Act. And the U.S. Equal Employment Opportunity Commission confirmed these exemptions in May of 2021. Federal EEO laws do not prevent an employer from requiring all employees physically entering the workplace to be vaccinated for COVID-19, so long as employers comply with the reasonable accommodation provisions of the ADA and Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 64 and other EEO considerations, the commission said in a statement. So if an employer has a blanket vaccination requirement and doesn't consider or just makes the the appearance of considering but not substantively consider legitimate medical and religious grounds for challenging the employer's mandate, the employer has violated EEO law, EEOC directives as well as potentially the Civil Rights Act of 1964, or depending on the the issue, the Americans with Disabilities Act, if it's a medical issue. So there's that. What else? I told you about the guidance from the EEOC. I told you that's being done by organizations today has never been done before. But what I also want you to know is a number of states have created laws protecting religious rights beyond the First Amendment. Florida and Texas, for example, allow parents to opt their children out of school vaccinations, citing deeply held religious beliefs or philosophical opposition. 21 states have religious freedom laws prohibiting even minimal interference with residents' right to practice their faith. In states with these laws, legislatures may need to amend the statute to avoid challenges and allow for universal vaccination mandates for adults. In other words, the key is to look at the state law requirements. So you have two courses here. Two courses here. Number one, the Federal Equal Employment Opportunity Commission and the use of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Americans with Disability Act, again, depending on what your situation is. That's number one. And number two, under state law, depending on what state you live in. Now, interestingly enough, in order, <clears throat> the Supreme Court, in order to nationalize issues with respect to abortion and other cultural issues and so forth, the Supreme Court has issued decision after decision after decision, even since that 1905 Jacobson decision, in the modern era, in the last half century, explicitly underscoring the right of individuals to their own bodies. To their own bodies. And prohibiting state or even federal laws and interfere with it. Like the use of contraceptives in 1965. Roe versus Wade, the first trimester. And multiple other decisions. 
where the court has been explicit about the right of individuals to protect their own bodies and to do what they wish with their own bodies. So there is a rather significant list of cases where the Supreme Court has made that position. A matter of federal law. Griswold versus Connecticut, 1965. You're allowed to buy and use contraceptives. Loving versus Virginia, 1967. You can marry anyone, regardless of race. Roe versus Wade. You're free to abort a, f- a baby in the first trimester. Uh, you may not be subjected to experimental drugs or therapies without your consent, even if you're in the military. United States versus Stanley, 1987. You're allowed to refuse medical treatment, including interventions that may save your life. Cruzen versus Director, Missouri Department of Health, 1990. You're allowed to have intimate sexual relations with people of the same sex. Lawrence versus Texas, 2003. You're allowed to marry them. Obergefell versus Hodges, 2015. The general phrase, my body, my choice, that's not in any of the decisions, but that certainly would lead to that kind of a conclusion. Now there's one other area you need to look at. I'm not saying this is a slam dunk, but I'm not saying what what companies are doing to their employees is a slam dunk either. That the way to confront this is to sue them. And if there are many of you, to pull your resources together and sue them together as plaintiffs. Moreover, the federal government has in many ways undermined the position it has taken, as well as the National Institutes of Health, the Infectious Disease Office that Fauci runs and so forth. How have they undermined their argument? Well, I have to take a break. When I come back, I'll explain. I'll be right back. Mark Levin. Are you worried about America's future? Times of trouble are full of reasons to despair. But those who built and have preserved our country didn't despair. And if we're going to do our part, we need to draw on the books, the history, and the ideas that gave our forefathers and mothers strength and inspiration. Hillsdale College was founded in 1844 to teach these things, and it teaches them still today. The great news is that we can all study these things along with Hillsdale College professors right in our homes. Through Hillsdale's free online courses, we can study the history of our civilization, the wisdom of ancient and Judeo-Christian philosophers, and the writings of Shakespeare and Mark Twain. We can reacquaint ourselves with our Constitution. We can learn how the Constitution has been undermined, and more importantly, how it can be recovered. My friends, as we fight in defense of family, faith, and freedom, let us draw on the best of the past with Hillsdale's guidance to save the greatest nation on earth. Begin learning today at levinforhillsdale.com. That's L-E-V-I-N for Hillsdale.com. Those of you who have medical and religious arguments and providing you with a legal roadmap, with a legal roadmap, here's the other half of the equation. You're supposed to be provided with reasonable accommodations. If you have natural immunity and antibodies, a reasonable accommodation is you have no vaccination requirement. You can point to multiple studies out of Israel and elsewhere that make it abundantly clear natural immunity is better, stronger than any of the vaccines. A reasonable accommodation is undergoing COVID testing from time to time. Another reasonable accommodation is people who can work from home can work from home. Another reasonable accommodation is if you have a real religious objection, that can't just be ignored and blown off. Under federal law, the Civil Rights Act of 1964, or EEOC guidance. But here's the problem also. The federal government is allowing illegal aliens into this country at a rate this country has never seen before. 
by the end of this year, millions. While they're talking about the pandemic and mandates for vaccinations. Well, if illegal aliens are not going to be tested and are not going to receive vaccinations, and we know a significant percentage of them aren't vaccinated because they're coming from hell holes all over the world, you definitely have an equal protection argument. And it undermines the seriousness of the mandates. It undermines the seriousness of the mandates. There's no vaccine requirement in the private sector, which hires illegal aliens, or in the government sector, which allows illegal aliens to cross over the border for vaccinations for foreigners who are here illegally. So that undermines the entire mandate argument. And of course, there's no federal statutory authority whatsoever for this kind of mandate. None. So companies that choose to do this on their own or businesses of any kind that choose to do this on their own have exposed themselves to litigation, to lawsuits. Because every one of you has certain rights under federal and in many cases state law. No matter what they say on television, no matter what Fauci says, no matter what any CEO or board of directors says, no matter what any commissioner of any sporting league has to say, each of you, depending on your situation, has certain federal and state rights, unalienable rights. And you can bring your case in federal court. State court, too. But depending on the state, you may wish to bring it into federal court. What do you sue them for? Violating your civil rights? In the case of medical uh, issues that had been rejected? You could also bring it under the Americans with Disabilities Act, which has its own fine and penalty system. And, of course, you can sue them uh, over uh, for pecuniary damages, including uh, emotional distress, and certainly for wages and any medical costs and so forth. So if there are a number of you in any business that have been treated this way, I would even argue cops, firefighters, and so forth, sue them. Pull your resources together and sue them. Are you worried about America's future? Times of trouble are full of reasons to despair. But those who build and have preserved our country didn't despair. And if we're going to do our part, we need to draw on the books, the history, and the ideas that gave our forefathers and mothers strength and inspiration. Hillsdale College was founded in 1844 to teach these things, and it teaches them still today. The great news is that we can all study these things along with Hillsdale College professors right in our homes. Through Hillsdale's free online courses, we can study the history of our civilization, the wisdom of ancient and Judeo-Christian philosophers, and the writings of Shakespeare and Mark Twain. We can reacquaint ourselves with our Constitution. We can learn how the Constitution has been undermined, and more importantly, how it can be recovered. My friends, as we fight in defense of family, faith, and freedom, let us draw on the best of the past with Hillsdale's guidance to save the greatest nation on earth. Begin learning today at levinforhillsdale.com. That's L-E-V-I-N for Hillsdale.com. Mark Levin, America's passionately cerebral voice. Talk with that voice now, 877-381-3811. The illegal immigration issue is a major factual issue uh, that undermines the government's position uh, when it comes to these mandates. Because in uh, allowing illegal immigration, the federal government is not enforcing federal immigration law. And in many states, particularly the blue states, states like New York and California, New Jersey, Michigan, so forth, they are not cooperating with the federal government and ICE when it comes to 287 uh, and assisting the federal government 
and allowing the federal government to know, federal immigration authorities, when uh, individuals that they are holding under state criminal law uh, are released. And so this whole issue of illegal immigration should really augur in favor of litigation uh, by those who are challenging the mandates, including against businesses that hire illegal immigrants, as a matter of fact. But there are laws and there are issues, and there is Supreme Court precedent uh, with respect to your own bodies and so forth. So when you hear people say things like, uh, you don't have a right to your liberty because of the, of the greater necessity to protect everybody. If you've already had this virus, uh, why are they even mentioning that to you? Since you're immune. Since you have the antibodies. If you're willing to have uh, COVID testing once or twice a week, why are they saying that to you? You're willing to be tested. And in this country, despite the secular corporatists, secular politicians, and secularists generally, religion is a big deal. It's protected under our Constitution in the First Amendment. It's protected by federal and state statutes. And so if you, if you have a legitimate religious claim, no HR department can just overlook that and say, well, we're not granting it to you. They don't have that kind of authority, ladies and gentlemen. Your religious liberty is a constitutional liberty. The head of HR at the direction of a CEO or or a senior vice president or some flunky doesn't have the power, doesn't have the power to neutralize the Constitution. They don't have the power to ignore the 1964 Civil Rights Act. They don't have the power to ignore an accommodation, a reasonable accommodation. Individuals need to be treated as individuals. So what I'm trying to say is, if a company has a a policy that says either you're vaccinated or you're fired, I would argue that violates, in many cases, state laws, but I would argue it violates the First Amendment, it violates the 1964 Civil Rights Act, And it may well violate the conditions of your employment. And you ought to challenge it. Again, I know challenges are expensive. You can pool your resources. And this goes for cities too. The way they're treating cops. And this goes for certain states too. You need a smart lawyer who's prepared to litigate. It's prepared to to duke it out, who represents several, if not a whole bunch of you, in a particular class, in a particular company. You should call around and find out who in your company has been let go and what issue they raised. You should call around and find out who in your police department has been let go and what issues were raised and what issues were ignored. Now, I don't know ultimately how the United States Supreme Court will rule. But I do know that what you're seeing taking place today really has never happened in American history. What I'm saying is we've never had a president who's put the pressure on private companies who doesn't have the statutory authority to issue a, federal ma- a national mandate. That's why he hasn't done it. But you can see the same corporations, for the most part, that have pushed critical race theory, that have embraced Black Lives Matter, that have embraced the genderism agenda, that have embraced the no-growth climate change agenda, even though it seems counterintuitive, that's what they do, are typically the same businesses and large corporations that are dropping the hammer. That are dropping the hammer. I'm just explaining to you what's available to you. I can't predict the outcome. But I'm just explaining to you what's available to you. And uh, it's not a surrender proposition. 
It simply is not. You'll see some professors and self-identified legal experts saying it's a slam dunk. It is not a slam dunk. It doesn't matter what district courts rule either. They're the first say, not the final say. They're the first say, not the final say. I hope this helps clarify a few things. It should. Let's go to John, Los Angeles, California, Sirius Satellite. John, how are you, sir? I'm doing okay, but uh, I, I, when I heard your, your what you were talking about today, and I listen to you every day, but uh, I, I, we had just been talking about with our attorney, uh, and we're we have actually 15 employees. We're in maintenance operations, and uh, about 12 of them are are laid off right now, or they're off. They're actually self terminated because uh, they didn't get the uh, vaccination by the 15th. And uh, who do you so guys work for? We work for the Los Angeles Unified School District, mm-hmm. which is which, which is acting as a as the vax police for the president, mm-hmm. you know, and for the governor here. And they're the ones who are putting down the hammer. You know, they're using are, all. Are their, you going to uh, consult with an attorney? Yes, we already have, and uh, he's consulting with another firm that does federal cases. But uh, all right, you ought to you ought to take what you ought to at least take the first part of my program and share it with the attorney. Yes, we, we are. And for and, anybody uh, who cares, it'll be on MarkLevinShow.com, the Mothership website, under a Daily Recap. It'll be up there within an hour of this show going off the air. Uh, and all he has to do is link to it and listen to it. Yeah, I'll make sure of that. And uh, but we're, we're heading in that direction because uh, we, we just believe we're strong arm and dur- under tremendous duress. People have 25, 30 years. 28 years in, and they're like two years from pensions, one year from pensions, uh-huh. and uh, they were they were just strong armed. You know, they didn't want to take the vaccinate vaccinations, and some didn't. They lost their positions. But I think everybody, even if you got vaxxed or not, you have a you have standing, and I think that it has to go to the Supreme Court. And if nobody, if we're willing to do it and stand together, and there's enough of us, we can do it. I agree with you. All right, John, thank you for your call. Again, I'm not sure of the outcome. But the idea that you don't have a case is ridiculous. Now, I'm vaccinated. I intend to get the booster, this J&J booster, when I can. That's not the issue. I'll do what I want to do. The issue is there's certain injustices taking place here. Certain injustices taking place here. And, of course, you have the whole science out there that talks about herd immunity, too. Um, But if I'm vaccinated and I'm taking the booster... I thought the government told me that I'm, uh, I'm in pretty damn good shape. See, this is also part of the problem. The government talks out of both sides of its mouth, and the factual predicate can be made, again, by a decent litigation attorney. On the one hand, they're mandating, or trying to, these businesses, based on information they're getting from the federal government, the use of vaccines and boosters. And so what's the problem? The people who are vaccinated, right, you're supposed to be protected. Now, nobody, no population is going to be 100% protected, but maybe 98% protected. That's the best you can expect. That's a tremendous result. Maybe 95% protected. That's a good thing, too. There's no 100% perfection, not in anything or any way. Certainly not in medicine or science. Not with a... uh, not with a virus that's really still relatively new, right? It's still a relatively new virus, as the vaccines are, are quite new. Um, for example, let's say you're pregnant, and you're concerned about this vaccine because there's some data that suggests you might have a miscarriage. If a business is forcing you to decide whether or not to take a chance with the vaccine and you may lose your baby, That's certainly not a reasonable accommodation. You can be tested every week. You can be tested twice a week. You don't need to be vaccinated. That's quite clear. I hear Whoopi Goldberg is blaming unvaccinated people for the death of Colin Powell because she's a clown, a buffoon. 
But Whoopi Goldberg won't complain about illegal aliens coming into this country by the hundreds of thousands, and by the end of the year, over two million who have not been vaccinated. That she won't complain about, because politically, she really can't go there. Socially, she really can't go there. Culturally, she really can't go there. She's just another fraud. Just another fraud. But there are many potential accommodations, reasonable accommodations, any business can provide to an individual. Many. And the testing is the key one. Look, a year, year and a half ago, what did everybody say? Testing was the answer. Testing. We need testing. We test it. You can go into almost any drugstore today and buy a testing kit by Abbott, by Abbott Laboratories. It's like a 20 bucks for two tests. And you know in 15 sec- excuse me, 15 minutes, if you have the virus. Have you ever seen this, Mr. Producer? You've not seen this? Mr. Producer, are you there? Have you seen this? You can go into CVS or Walgreens or another store. They have the test right there. All you do is you, you use a swab. And in 15 minutes, you know. The testing, the testing, the testing. Well, under the prior president, look at the testing we have now. It's phenomenal. It's almost immediate. So how can some business just start firing people, saying, I'm sorry, your religious accommodation doesn't cut it. I'm sorry, your medical accommodation doesn't cut it. I'm sorry, you may have had the virus, but uh, we don't, we don't uh, uh, consider natural immunity uh, scientifically uh, reasonable, which, of course, it's, it's a fact. How can they say that now when you have these 15-minute tests? Remember when Fauci and everybody said, testing is the answer. The more we test, the more we know. The more we know, the better we can do. So there's really no reason for most of this. As a rational matter. That's why I keep speaking out about it. I just decided, let me dig into the law tonight. Let's do something productive. I'll be right back. Mark Lovin. Are you worried about America's future? Times of trouble are full of reasons to despair. But those who built and have preserved our country didn't despair. And if we're going to do our part, we need to draw on the books, the history, and the ideas that gave our forefathers and mothers strength and inspiration. Hillsdale College was founded in 1844 to teach these things, and it teaches them still today. The great news is that we can all study these things along with Hillsdale College professors right in our homes. Through Hillsdale's free online courses, we can study the history of our civilization, the wisdom of ancient and Judeo-Christian philosophers, and the writings of Shakespeare and Mark Twain. We can reacquaint ourselves with our Constitution. We can learn how the Constitution has been undermined, and more importantly, how it can be recovered. My friends, as we fight in defense of family, faith, and freedom, let us draw on the best of the past with Hillsdale's guidance to save the greatest nation on earth. Begin learning today at levinforhillsdale.com. That's L-E-V-I-N for Hillsdale.com. Ducey with Jen Psaki at the White House briefing today. Cut 10, go. The whole point of a vaccine mandate is to make people safer. But a vaccine mandate also means tons of police and military may walk off the job. Then at the end of the day, does a vaccine mandate make people safe? Well, where are tons of police and military walking off the job? Well, the Washington Post says that hundreds of thousands of U.S. service members remain unvaccinated, uh, which is leading to questions about possible military readiness. Uh, the L.A. County Sheriff says that 5 to 10 percent of their workforce could walk off the job. And so considering the, I mean, is there any concern about that? Well, I would say what we point to or what I would point you to is evidence with uh, a range of companies, organizations, 
Frankly, the Department of Defense can also give you the up-to-date statistics on members of the military. I believe it's over 90 percent, but I would point you them for in statistics. Branches, but there are other problems in the world than COVID-19. <laughs> International terror, gang violence, murder, arson, drug what, dealing. What was, Is there any what, concern what was the high, what things? was the What was the number one cause of death among police officers last year? Do you know? COVID-19. So that's something that we're working to address, and police departments are working to address. If you look at Seattle as an example, which I know has been in the, some of the reporting, 92 percent of the police force is vaccinated, as are 93 percent of firefighters. So then what's 99 the percent. So what's the problem? 93 percent? That's effectively full vaccinations. And you have to assume at least a significant part of the other 7 percent have had the virus. Or it can't be vaccinated. Go ahead. Wow. Well, what I would have said, and it's hard to do it, I would have said, okay, of that 7%, how many have natural immunity and how many have uh, medical issues? She has no idea. Go ahead. Employees have submitted vaccine verification or an exemption request. Safety, though. All these other problems, terror, murder, robberies, kidnappings. Is there any concern that if police forces shrink or if the size of the ready military force shrinks, that the United States or localities may not be equipped properly Peter, to deal with Peter, that? Peter, more than 700,000 people have died of COVID. Yes, uh, but again. Ms. Pisaki. Which position are you taking today? That people with the vaccine are still vulnerable to the disease, so they need booster shots? Or they're still vulnerable to variants? What exactly is your position? That the vaccine is foolproof? That it's not foolproof? What about herd immunity? You can't talk about that anymore. Their position is nonsensical. And of course, never is there a discussion about what about your individual liberty under these various federal and state statutes? They don't care about that. That's of no consequence whatsoever. None. I mean, it's your body, your choice, apparently, except when it comes to this. And as I said before, we've never seen anything like this before from the federal government, or for that matter, businesses, putting down the iron fist and trying to force people who cannot be vaccinated or for whom it would be dangerous, potentially pregnant women, and moreover, individuals that have immunity, um... I think there's some legal vulnerabilities there, ladies and gentlemen. I really do. As well as religious objections. All right, I'll be right back. He's here. He's here. Now, broadcasting from the underground command post, deep in the bowels of a hidden bunker, somewhere under the brick and steel of a nondescript building, we've once again made contact with our leader, Mark Levin. Hello, America. Mark Levin here. Our number, 877-381-3811, 877-381-3811. Those of you who've been with this program for a relatively long period of time, I bet you're smiling every now and then when you listen to radio or you watch TV. Because things we've discussed over the last nearly 20 years and things I've written about from one book to the next are now being mainstreamed. Mainstreamed, not with the big propaganda media, but in conservative media. Remember many years ago, right after Liberty and Tyranny, I wrote a book called Ameritopia. It was a tough book. But it talked about utopianism and the use of utopianism. It's impossibility, but it's use as an argument, as a fraudulent policy to attack human and institutional imperfections in a free society. 
and I walked through the history of utopianism, whether it was Plato's Republic and on down the line. And um, I called the book Ameritopia. So you hear people today talking about utopianism. Dystopianism. But it was all presented in that book. Boy, oh boy, how many years ago was that? It's got to be 10 or 11 years ago. Move up to the issue today of American Marxism. Those of you who have the book and have read it, those of you who have the e-book and have read it, those of you who have it in the audio platform and have listened to it, you have to be smiling too. Because we are achieving what it is that we set out to do, all of us. You're hearing more and more references to Marxism and communism by braver and braver hosts on radio and TV. And you can tell when they use the terms Marxism, American Marxism, even communism and so forth, that these are people who get it, who've read American Marxism. Whether they credit me or not is beside the point. You can see challenges now to the corporatists and corporations that I discuss at length in the book. These challenges are being made. One company at a time. They don't deserve a pass. Do they? You can see the challenges growing at school board meetings. People focusing on the perniciousness of the of the teachers' unions, the Democrat Party, and the school boards, that iron triangle against educating and providing your kids with quality education. You can see the pushback on what is truly a bizarre movement, genderism. More and more people willing to speak out. More and more people willing to stand up. These things don't just happen. We tolerated a lot two years ago. The forcible shutting of synagogues and churches, other religious institutions, the unequal treatment of businesses, warehouse businesses being treated one way, small businesses being treated another way. We've seen a lot of this. And you're on to it. But it was tolerated two years ago. It's not tolerated so much today, is it? This is because of you. It's really been the last, I'd say, six to eight months as we've been talking about American Marxism, as you've been listening to the audio or reading American Marxism. And as I say, I've spent a lot of time on it, both here and on Levin TV and on Fox. I'm truly convinced it's had an enormous impact and it's going to continue to have an enormous impact. I don't know. We know tomorrow, but I think this book will be on the New York Times bestseller list for 14 weeks in a row by tomorrow's announcement. Of course, the New York Times hates it, and they'll do everything they can to remove it. We actually beat Anderson Cooper last week, but they they gave him a higher spot on the list than my book. This is what they do, so be it. This book just keeps pressing on, pressing on, pressing on, even though I talk about it less and less. Because the lessons in the book, the history in the book, the activism in the book speak for themselves at this point, don't they? You're the people who are encouraging your family, your friends, your colleagues, your neighbors. You're the people, your fellow parishioners, who are spreading the word about American Marxism and the book American Marxism. It's word of mouth. Last week, 20,000 copies were sold. In week 14. Week 14. And because of you and the message that you're passing along, and the people who are heeding your message, 
This will be the number one book, nonfiction or fiction, in 2011. We already know it. Nothing's close. Bob Woodward, I think maybe he'll sell 350,000 books, something in that ballpark. We're nearly at 1.1 million. And there's a reason why it gets so little attention by the propaganda media. They can't answer it. There have been a couple bizarre attempts, but they can't answer it. And what I find so remarkable, quite frankly, is the author. It's when I watch the news, when I watch my brothers and sisters on Fox or listen to well, I don't listen to a lot of radio, actually, but, but listen to people speak. It's obvious that the phraseology, that the arguments, that the comprehension is spreading. It's spreading. And you're the one spreading it. Thanksgiving isn't far away. I hope you'll acquire your copies of American Marxism. Maybe there'll be some people at the table who are unfamiliar with it, or some kids that have been in college or university and you want to persuade them to at least consider the arguments that we make, I think that's a good time. It's also a good time to acquire your copies as gifts for Christmas and Hanukkah and other other events. I don't think you'll find anything more worthwhile for 16 or 17 bucks, to be perfectly honest with you. Paper shortage or no paper shortage, which is apparently occurring, and it'll be tough for books around Christmas uh, that have not yet been printed. Just pointing it out, because that's what my publisher told me. And so, so much of what you hear, so much of the language, so much of the phraseology you're hearing now comes straight out of the book. And so much of what our enemies are doing, I don't call them adv- adversaries, as you know, I don't call them opponents, they're enemies, because they're enemies of your family, your faith, and this republic. It was also predicted in this book, because they are predictable, once you know who they are. And it's crucially important that we get our language back, and it's crucially important that we use it. That we use it. Very, very important. There's many good books out now. I've had many wonderful authors on, and I'm going to have more. Tomorrow we have Molly Hemingway on the program. I very much look forward to it. And we've had others, Brett Baer, and we'll have more. But my point to you is, in terms of what is a comprehensive, substantive uh, knowledge base of what's actually occurring, who's doing what, And what we can do about it, American Marxism appears to be the book that's that's providing the context and the answers. And you know, uh, I told you the other day when I was finished with this book and I handed it to my wife, and she'd been looking. She had been looking at every chapter anyway. I said, I don't know how well this book's going to do, and she said, it's going to do extremely well. I said, well, I don't know. It's a different kind of book. It's a book filled with scholarship. On the other hand, it's a book filled with explanations by me. And then at the end, it's got 10,000 words of activism at the end. I said, I've never really written a book like this. And the name, which I came up with about two-thirds of the way in, American Marxism, I think was very, very important. Because using it, A bold name, which is an accurate phrase for what's taking place in this country, showed people that we can stand up to this, and we must stand up to this. You know, I watch the political analysts. I don't sit around waiting for them, but now and then I watch the Karl Roves and others. And um, they'll talk about what's going to happen in 2022 and with the whiteboards and all. It's very smart. But what many of these analysts don't understand is why these things are going to happen in 2022. They just say it's because Biden's so lousy or that. No, it's more than that. 
It's much more than that. It's because you folks are informed. It's because you folks are intelligent. The Bushies, the Cheneyites, the Never Trumpers have never understood this. And it doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter. So I hope you'll get your copies of American Marxism now. You can get it on Amazon.com. You know, I do have to laugh a little bit when people say, I'm not using Amazon. I, I see these people, uh, public figures. I'm not using Amazon.com anymore. Meanwhile, they're using Twitter. What's the difference? Twitter's even worse, as far as I'm concerned. But everybody uses Amazon.com, even though they say they don't. Pretty much. You're all smiling. You know I'm right. But Amazon has done nothing but made my book available to as many people who want to acquire it at 40% off. Walmart's done a tremendous job. Costco's done a tremendous job. Barnes & Noble, Books a Million, Sam's Club, BJ's. I'm sure I left somebody out. Honestly, all the retailers, except Hudson maybe at the airports, but all the retailers have been tremendous. And Amazon's been tremendous. This is the number one book of 2021 because of you. Because you've had enough. Because you believe in liberty. And you reject American Marxism. I'll be right back. Mark Lovin. Over 2,000 of you, my listeners, made the switch from overpriced wireless carriers to Pure Talk over the past few months. We want the rest of you to join us and to see what we're talking about. If you're with AT&T and Verizon or T-Mobile, your family could save over $800 a year just by switching to Pure Talk. You get great coverage, you can keep your phone and your number, and you'll save a fortune. Pure Talk is the top-rated wireless company by Consumer Affairs with the absolute best consumer service team based right here in America. Does that sound good? Well, it gets better. Right now, get unlimited talk, text, and six gigs of data, just $30 a month. And if you go over on data, they don't charge you for it. They don't care. Go to puretalkusa.com and enter promo code Levin Podcast. Again, puretalkusa.com, promo code Levin, L E V I N Podcast. And when you do, you'll save 50% off your first month. That's puretalkusa.com, promo code Levin Podcast. Pure Talk USA, simply smarter wireless. As Communist China barrels ahead with its military as fascistic Russia barrels ahead with its military and they are a military force whether people want to accept it or not we're destroying ourselves from within and we've talked about this matter of fact before I really wrote American Marxism I was thinking of writing a book called the war on two fronts which was going to be American Marxism and also Communist China, but it was too much to undertake because American Marxism is the longest book I wrote in and of itself. But at the Washington Post, they have an opinion writer, Micheline Maynard, who says, uh, just get used to it. What's your problem? For more than a century, she says, business experts have been trying to dial up the United States efficiency ever since Frederick Tiller published The principles of scientific management in 1911, companies have focused on doing things more quickly and raising consumers' expectations as a result. Actually, it's not since he wrote the book. It's called The Industrial Revolution. But Taylor's ideas didn't take into account the havoc a pandemic might do to supply chains. What are you talking about? There was a massive deadly flu in 1917. Remember the history of that, Mr. Producer? What is she talking about? And how that would blunt what a few months ago seemed like a looming resumption of modern daily life's zippy pace. Across the country, Americans' expectations of speedy service and easy access to consumer products have been crushed, like a styrofoam container in a trash compactor. Wow, what a turn of a phrase. Time for some new, more realistic expectations. Fast food is less fast. A huge flotilla of container ships is stuck offshore in California, waiting to unload. Shelves normally stocked with Halloween candy this time of year are empty. 
And I saw the other day at a Target here in Ann Arbor, Michigan. The issue has become so troublesome with alarming economic and political ramifications. The White House is stepping in, urging unions, port operators, and big consumer groups companies to work around the clock to unclog supply pipelines. American consumers, their expectations pampered and catered to for decades, are not accustomed to inconvenience. For generations, American shoppers have been trained to be nightmares, Amanda Mull wrote in August in The Atlantic, another left-wing operation, before the supply chain problem turned truly ugly. The pandemic has shown just how desperately the consumer class clings to the feeling of being served. What she's doing here is attacking the middle class. The middle class, which is what the Washington Compost, the New York Slimes, and all the rest of them always do. Customers' persistent whine, why don't you just hire more people, sounds feeble in the era of great resignation, especially in industries such as food service with reputations being tough places to work. Notice she doesn't point out Biden and the Democrat policies of paying people not to work. Rather than living constantly on the verge of throwing a fit and risking taking it out on overwhelmed servers, struggling shop owners, or late-arriving delivery people, we do ourselves a favor by consciously lowering expectations. Now, here's the thing. Servers, shop owners, delivery people are among us, not the Washington compost class. Lowering expectations. Lowering expectations. That's right. Smooth the road over centralized government and government planning. It's been so good. Expect to be poor. Expect less technology. Less medicines. So rather than improving our governing system, rather than embracing our capitalist system and more of a free market system, we should embrace American Marxism and what comes with it. I don't know where you live, she says, but in Ann Arbor, the luxury of blithely Uh, Tapping on a phone and summoning a restaurant delivery that arrives in 45 minutes is over. There's a shortage of food delivery drivers nationwide. The sanity-preserving move is to assume an hour and a half for delivery, and then a mere hour and 10 minutes is a pleasant surprise. Lower your expectations. I'll tell you what's happening here. I was in the car last night, and I was driving to grab a bite. Luckily, my wife comes back into town tonight. Because I don't know how to cook. And I was listening to my buddy briefly, Ben Shapiro, and he made a brilliant point. Something to the effect, we can't survive as a nation when about one-third of the people are capitalists and the other two-thirds are socialists. That is, one-third subsidizing and caring for the other two-thirds. That's exactly correct. as hell. That's why I like Mark Levin. And I'm not sure a lot of people like him. He's tough as hell. But I like him. I love him. Call in now. 877-381-3811. He's so good. He drives them nuts, doesn't he? New York Post, Miranda Devine, who's unbelievable. Jack Morfett, Kevin Sheehan, Christopher Sadowski, and Bruce Golding. Biden is secretly flying underage migrants into New York in the dead of night. Aren't you sick and tired of government operating this way, ladies and gentlemen, under cover of dark, without the American people even knowing what's taking place? If you've been reading the Washington Compost or New York Slimes, you wouldn't even know about any of this. Plane loads of underage migrants are being flown secretly into suburban New York. Here's my first question. Who is deciding where the illegal aliens go? Who is deciding where they go? Somebody's making that decision, and I guarantee it's right out of the White House. It's probably Ron Klain or Susan Rice or one of the other malcontents and reprobates. They're clearly trying to affect the suburbs, clearly trying to turn Texas and Florida. This is a a, a disgrace. And why the Republicans... Don't at least draw up articles of impeachment. I will never know. I will never know. They're so so frightened. They're so worried. 
The other side's never frightened and are never worried. Our guys, they're just so risk averse. And this isn't even a risk. The charter flights originate in Texas, where the ongoing border crisis has overwhelmed local immigration officials and have been underway since at least August, according to sources familiar with the matter. Last week, the New York Post saw two planes land at the Westchester County Airport, where most of the passengers got off, appeared to be children and teens, with a small portion appearing to be men in their 20s. Westchester County cops stood by as the passengers whose flights arrived at 10.49 p.m. Wednesday and 9.52 p.m. Friday, got off and piled into buses. So it's a highly organized effort. Some of them were later seen meeting up with relatives or sponsors in New Jersey or being dropped off at a residential facility on Long Island. A New York Post analysis of online flight tracking data suggests that around 2,000 of the underage migrants have arrived at the airport outside White Plains, on 21 flights since August 8th. That's not too far from your neighborhood, is it, Rich? Records show some of the planes touched down between midnight and 6.30 a.m. when a voluntary curfew is in effect, with two arriving from Houston at 2.13 a.m. and 4.29 a.m. on August 20th. You don't do things at 2.13 and 4.29 a.m. if you don't want to be caught. The clandestine nature of the operation raises questions about how the White House is dealing with a recent surge in unaccompanied minors. The most recent figures from U.S. Customs and Border Protection show that just during July and August, 37,800 unaccompanied minors were caught entering America from Mexico, sometimes after being abandoned by professional smugglers known as coyotes. By the way, do you know that 45,000, 45,000 miners, not coal miners, miners, M-I-N-O-R-S, for you liberals out there, miners are unaccounted for? 45,000. You know what must be going on with the sex trade in this country? It just must be unbelievable. Let's see here. Source familiar with the operation at the Westchester Airport, said the underage miners typically arrive carrying backpacks and are bused to locations including the Bronx, Brooklyn, Queens, upstate Newburgh, Bridgeport, Danbury, Connecticut, and so forth. Around 12.30 a.m. Saturday, it stopped in Long Island at the campus of Mercy First, a nonprofit sponsored by the Catholic Sisters of Mercy that provides housing and services for children and adolescents who are the victims of societal problems, according to its website. Yeah, we don't have enough of that in our, in our country, homegrown. On Friday night, one bus left the Westchester Airport and barreled down the Hutchinson River Parkway, which is off limits to commercial vehicles, at speeds greater than 75 miles per hour before crossing the Throgs Neck Bridge. Mercy First has a contract to supply the federal government with residential services for immigrant youth, according to the site. Mercy First CEO Renee Skalaski didn't return a request for comment. Later Saturday, a similar scene began playing out in Jacksonville, Florida, where many of the flights from Texas have touched down before continuing on to Westchester, where the Post saw a Boeing 737-700 land shortly after 10 p.m. at Jacksonville International Airport. As local cops stood by, a group of between 10 and 15 people wearing matching white baseball caps and carrying duffel bags got off the plane and onto a charter bus near a dormant cargo terminal. This is very highly organized. After a two-hour ride, the group arrived around 1 a.m. Sunday at the Twin Oaks Academy, a juvenile detention center in the the Apalachicola National Forest near Tallahassee where staffers were waiting to open a gate topped with barbed wire. Republican Florida Governor Ron DeSantis expressed outrage at the New York Post findings, with a spokeswoman saying, if the Biden administration is so confident that their open border policy is good for our country, why the secrecy? Why is the Biden administration refusing to share even the most basic information about illegal alien resettlement in communities throughout our state and the entire country? Spokeswoman Christina Pashaw said, Washington, D.C. sets immigration policies that do not affect them in the states that lack information about migrant resettlement 
and do not have the authority to change federal immigration policy are expected to bear the brunt of Biden's reckless open borders agenda. On Wednesday, the New York Post also saw two buses leave the Westchester Airport carrying about 100 passengers on a McDonnell Douglas MD-83. One bus stopped at the Thomas Edison service area off the New Jersey Turnpike in Woodbridge, where the migrants got off around 12.45 a.m. Thursday. I've stopped there many a times. Over the next two hours, they were driven away in cars by people who met them there without anyone appearing to have to show identification to the officials overseeing the operation. Now think about that. That is shocking. They could be handing them over to perverts or into the sex slave business. A woman who lives near the airport told the Post on Monday that a flight arrived around 3 or 4 that morning and it was shaking the house and awakened her 8-month-old baby boy. So a lot of these airports are shut down from like midnight to 4 or 5 in the morning. And uh, what's happening is a lot of these flights are landing during that time frame. He's been waking up for the last month, two, three, four in the morning because of the noise. I got used to the regular airport noise, but these planes or jets sound different. Lower, more bass, and they're coming in the middle of the night. The neighbor also said she can see the airport perfectly from my upstairs and has noticed a few buses that say out of service, hanging around that aren't the usual county buses or airport shuttles. This is happening in America, and this is happening in communities all over the country. And she said, the airport has been lately much darker than usual overnight. I like the way it looked a little like a city, blue and white lights, so they're, they're shutting their lights off. She said, but the middle of this summer, they are all off. Expect one or two of them on the top of the flex jet hangar, I guess, so you can, can't see what's going on. Unbelievable. Former Westchester County Executive Rob Astorino, who we've had on this program, Republican candidate for governor, said he learned about the flights from citizens upset by violations of the voluntary curfew. He said smaller planes apparently began arriving in April when he said the flights weren't as frequent. When he held an August 16 news conference at the airport, he said a flight arrived carrying passengers who got onto a bus that pulled up close to the air stairs, partially blocked the view of the people boarding it. Meanwhile, spokeswoman for Democratic Westchester County Executive George Latimer tried to downplay the situation as nothing new. Well, that's what the Democrats do. They lie. The White House insisted that the flights only carry children and teens, and the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services said it's our legal responsibility to safely care for unaccompanied children until they can be swiftly united with a parent or vetted sponsor. No, it's your responsibility to secure the border so we don't have these issues. So we don't have these issues. This is all about politics, ladies and gentlemen. It's not about compassion. It's not about humanity. They are sending many of these illegal aliens, quite frankly, into the suburbs. There's no story here about these kids being released in Newark, New Jersey, or Canada, New Jersey, or in New York City proper. Well, there's some of that, but not a lot of that. Out to Westchester and Long Island. This has gone on all over the country, all over the country. It's absolutely despicable. Using these little kids as pawns, violating federal immigration law, the Department of Justice, that jackass, the Attorney General sits there targeting parents. And of course, the Democrats in Congress are still chasing Donald Trump. I'll be right back. Mark Lovin. Over 2,000 of you, my listeners, made the switch from overpriced wireless carriers to Pure Talk over the past few months. We want the rest of you to join us and to see what we're talking about. If you're with AT&T and Verizon or T-Mobile, your family could save over $800 a year just by switching to Pure Talk. You get great coverage, you can keep your phone and your number, and you'll save a fortune. Pure Talk is the top-rated wireless company by Consumer Affairs with the absolute best consumer service team based right here in America. Does that sound good? Well, it gets better. Right now, get unlimited talk, text, and six gigs of data, just $30 a month. And if you go over on data, they don't charge you for it. They don't care. 
Go to puretalkusa.com and enter promo code Levin Podcast. Again, puretalkusa.com, promo code Levin, L E V I N Podcast. And when you do, you'll save 50% off your first month. That's puretalkusa.com, promo code Levin Podcast. Pure Talk USA, simply smarter wireless. Shot up to number one on Amazon, I am told. And uh, this book that she wrote, which obviously she hopes to make a lot of money, she won't. But she's destroyed her already tattered reputation, such as it was. A lot of people have talked about how she edited out Ruth Bader Ginsburg's denunciation of Kaepernick and taking a knee during a football game and how inappropriate that was and how she frowned upon that. And Katie Carrick said she did that because she wanted to protect the justice from her legacy being attacked or her reputation being attacked. But that's not what she was doing, ladies and gentlemen. You know what she was doing? What she was doing was trying to conceal the fact that the vast majority of Americans, the vast majority of Americans, including the most left-wing justice on the United States Supreme Court, not just Donald Trump, not just us, disapproved of what Kaepernick did and disapproved of what the other players were doing and disapproved of the commissioner of the NFL and the other leagues who basically sanctioned it over time. And so what Katie Carrick didn't want you to know is what all of the modern propagandists dressed up as journalists don't want you to know. That when it comes to ideas, we truly are in the great majority. Well, how do we lose elections? That's a different issue. In part, we lose elections because the other side lies, the other side cheats. And they have the media on their side, the biggest propaganda organization on the face of the earth. The biggest on the face of the earth. In many ways, it's much more diabolical than the state-run media in communist China or fascistic Russia or the Islamo-Nazi regime in Iran and so forth. Because they pretend that they're operating under the First Amendment. They pretend that they're actually bringing us news when, in fact, they are evil. And they're doing no such thing. Terry McAuliffe does not want to run on the issues. He's getting a lot of advice from Washington consultants. He's getting a lot of advice from Democrat Party leaders. And they're telling him, whatever you do, don't run on the issues. It's just like this big, massive omnibus bill that they want to pass to destroy your life, your lifestyle, and that of your children forever. Don't really explain what's in it. Just use platitudes and just trash any opposition. Well, that's what Terry McAuliffe's doing. He's now running around saying that uh, Glenn Youngkin will eliminate abortion. Well, ladies and gentlemen, Glenn Youngkin couldn't eliminate abortion if he wanted to. We all know this because of the Supreme Court. We all know this. But Terry McAuliffe also knows that so much of it is utterly stupid and moronic. And he believes the women in the suburbs that this will really trigger them. That this is their big issue. And so uh, he's running commercials now to that effect, just so you know, nation. A CNN host by the name of Kate Bolden actually pressed McAuliffe, quite wisely I thought, about why is he running against Donald Trump? Why aren't you running against Youngkin? Because they've obviously done some polling and so forth. So when we come back, I want you to hear this, and I also want to dig a little bit further into what's going on so the people of Virginia, as well as you all over the world, all over the country, can know. Not only have they violated tax laws, and they have, 
with the Vice President of the United States. And they're still doing that. They're still going to run her video in black churches, over 300 of them, in violation of federal Internal Revenue Code requirements. He still has this Stacey Abrams who campaigned for him, who is an election denier and a radical kook. Next, they'll bring in Barack Milhouse, Benito Obama, and then they're going to have Biden shuffle in. But I want you to hear this. I'll be right back. Ladies and gentlemen, this final hour of the podcast is sponsored exclusively by AMAC, the Association of Mature American Citizens. Now over 2 million conservative members strong, AMAC believes in and stands up for the values that we care about, faith, family, and freedom. Thank you for listening, and please support AMAC. And you can become a member at amac.us slash join. He's here. He's here. Now, broadcasting from the underground command post, deep in the bowels of a hidden bunker, somewhere under the brick and steel of a nondescript building, we've once again made contact with our leader, Mark Levin. Hello, America. Mark Levin here. Our number, 877 3-8-1-3-8-1-1. As I was saying, if I was rudely interrupted by the clock, Kate Bolden is a CNN host, and Terry McAuliffe is on her show today. Mr. Producer, seriously, will you reach out to Terry McAuliffe and tell him I would like to interview him? Just give it a shot. She wants to know, why do you talk so much about Donald Trump? Cut 13, go. But Terry, to my question... Yeah. Do you think you're yeah. do you view your only path to success? Because it is a clear choice that you talk about Donald Trump so much. Do you see your only path to success here as making this Terry McAuliffe versus Donald Trump? No, I, I have spent most of this campaign. If you look at my advertising, I just looked I... at one of your long ads during the break. I'm here in Virginia. I just watched it on Fox. And it was all about Trump. And it was all about uh, Yunkin. Uh, if Yunkin's governor, he's going to prevent women from having abortions. Now, this guy's a lowlife. He's an absolute lowlife. Uh, Glenn Yunkin has never indicated that, and Glenn Yunkin couldn't do it if he wanted to. No governor can do that. None. None. Regardless of my personal feelings, no governor has the power to overturn the Supreme Court. Just the way it is. So McAuliffe is a liar. And the Washington Compost doesn't call him out as a liar, even though it's one of the local papers that covers Virginia, obviously. And he won't be called out by the Constipated News Network or MSLSD because they agree with him. Remember, I spent an entire hour on this yesterday where the media are coming from. I've written an entire book on it, on freedom of the press. And I actually included chapter six in American Marxism and addressed it even further, putting a finer point on it. So here's McCullough. Go ahead. There's huge differences, Kate, in this campaign. I'm for raising the minimum wage to 15 bucks. I'm for paid family medical leave. I'm for paid sick leave. All right, so, so he wants the state taxpayers to pay for paid family leave and he wants the small businesses to raise the minimum wage. He wants to turn Virginia into Maryland. And what's going to happen here, I already see it, is people are leaving the state. The state is changing. It's becoming an appendage, certainly the northern part of the state, of the federal government, where you have a combination of uh, federal contractors, federal bureaucrats, and, uh, and big tech. AOL has a massive presence. In Northern Virginia, and in fact, 80% of all internet traffic flows through Loudoun County, Virginia, believe it or not. You see these massive windowless, massive windowless buildings, several football fields long, one after another, after another, after another. I'm sure the communist Chinese haven't targeted that. But that's what this election's about in Virginia, too. Fundamentally altering the state. You can see Democrats took over in Loudoun County, the school board in January, for the first time since I've lived here, and you see the damage that they've done, absolute destruction to the classrooms, to the textbooks, 
to the entire environment in the public school system. No longer focused on quality education. Destroyed the school system in Loudoun County. Covered up rape in Loudoun County. They've only been in office for 10 months. He's for paid sick leave. He's for paid family medical leave. And so you folks in Virginia can expect your taxes to go through the roof. You're paying about 5.5% income taxes now. That's not going to stay. That's going to jump up. And you can also expect your property taxes to go through the roof, too. Go ahead. One of those. He wants to ban abortions. He got caught on tape saying he will go on offense to ban abortion and defund Planned Parenthood. Well, defunding Planned Parenthood, what's wrong with that? Planned Parenthood is a private, nonprofit organization, supposedly. Why is it untouchable? I mean, they go after the NRA, they go after other groups that support the Bill of Rights and so forth, which they disagree with, obviously. So, plan- oh, he's going he's gonna to defund Planned Parenthood, oh, he's going to go after... So what? So what? The Democrats and their $400 trillion bill, they want the federal government to pay for abortions during any time of a pregnancy. What do you need Planned Parenthood for? Go ahead. Hey, now after what we've seen in Texas with the Trump Supreme Court, if Glenn Youngkin is elected governor, abortions will cease here in the Commonwealth of Virginia. The Trump Supreme Court. Isn't that clever? He's such a sleazeball. All the Supreme Court said was it didn't rule on the substance of the case. It said... You came here too soon. You've got to go through the process. There's a lot of very, very important cases involving all aspects of this society. If you don't go through the process, they all just show up at the door of the Supreme Court. Well, the Supreme Court doesn't operate that way. It's never operated that way. So here you have a low IQ sleazeball. You know, if Glenn Youngkin's elected here and you got the Trump Supreme Court, you know what the Trump Supreme Court's going to do? Meanwhile, they talk about the Trump Supreme Court that didn't take up a single election case. There's your Trump Supreme Court. But it doesn't matter. You might remember Terry McAuliffe did not accept the outcome of the 2000 election. He didn't accept the outcome of the 2016 election. Stacey Abrams doesn't accept the outcome of her defeat in her own failed election. But they're very worried about the Trump Supreme Court. (laughs) And look at their obsession with killing babies, by the way. Look at their obsession with killing babies. Unbelievable. Go ahead. Women's right to choose will be gone. That's what I talk about every single day. Women's right to choose will be gone. Okay, Terry McAuliffe, I'm prepared to bet you $1 million right now that if Glenn Youngkin is elected governor of Virginia... He will be unable to eliminate abortions in Virginia. One million dollars. Let me say it again. I'm prepared to bet Terry McAuliffe one million dollars. If Glenn Youngkin is elected governor of Virginia, he would not be able to eliminate abortions in Virginia. I'm not saying he would want to or not want to. I'm saying he would not be able to. Now, will you take me up on that bet, Terry McCullough? Now, if you win, God forbid, obviously the bet doesn't count. But if you lose and Glenn Youngkin is elected governor, let's put a million dollars up. Look, I actually had to work for my money. You obviously... uh, Anyway, so, and I'm saying that Glenn Youngkin, even if he wanted to, he would not be able to eliminate abortions, certainly all abortions in Virginia. Just can't do it. That's what he said. Abortions will cease here in the Commonwealth of Virginia. I'm saying, and I'm saying unfortunately, abortions will not cease here in the Commonwealth of Virginia. You ready to bet, tough guy? You ready to bet, sleazeball? I'll bet you're not. But the bet's on the table if you want to take it. 
Glenn Youngkin at a rally today. This man is serious about confronting critical race theory. Terry McAuliffe not only doesn't understand what critical race theory is because he's a moron, but he says it's a dog whistle. A dog whistle? Pal, you're the dog who's doing the whistling. Cut 14, go. We have some abhorrent chapters in our history. We have to teach them. But friends, Dr. Martin Luther King called us all to be better than we are. He called us to judge one another based on the content of our character and not the color of our skin. And critical race theory is a political agenda that is absolutely in our schools. And it teaches everyone to view everything through a lens of race and then pits our children against one another. So, friends, on day one, we will teach history, but I will ban critical race theory. Wow, doesn't he sound frightening and extreme, ladies and gentlemen? The guy's basically a moderate Republican who's conservative on certain issues. And I'll take it over this nutjob sleazeball, Terry McAuliffe, who supports abortion on demand paid for by the taxpayers, who wants you to pay for sick leave, who wants you to pay for family leave. Your income taxes in Virginia, they're going to go through the roof. They're going to double, in my estimation. And your property taxes, by the time he's done paying off the teachers' unions, they're going to go through the roof, too. You won't even want to live in this state anymore. I'll be right back. Mark Levin. AMAC, the Association of Mature American Citizens, is one of the fastest growing organizations in America. Now over 2 million conservative members strong, and I'm one of them. AMAC believes in and stands up for the values that we constitutional conservatives care about. More than talk, AMAC fights. A full-time presence in Washington, AMAC pushes back against reckless spending, disasters like Medicare for All, and the expanding reach of the federal government. And beyond advocacy, joining AMAC gives you access to a wealth of benefits and discounts, including special member-only rates on car insurance, travel discounts, cell phone plans, and a hell of a lot more. And if that's not enough, you'll get AMAC's bi-monthly magazine full of insightful articles on issues that matter to most of us, we conservatives. As I said, I'm an AMAC member, and you should be too. Join today at amac.us. That's A-M-A-C dot U-S. Stop supporting the liberal agenda that the other 50-plus organization has been pushing for. Join AMAC instead. A-M-A-C dot U-S. There's a site called Myth-Inform. I heard of its site. Here's a secretly recorded video taken in sixth grade in a classroom in Franklin Woods Intermediate School, Columbus, Ohio. And it shows critical race theory being taught after the superintendent said it was not being taught. There's very few superintendents that I trust, by the way. Cut 15, go. Some people might call it racist. There's actually three categories. If you've read the book Scamped, you'll hear that there's three areas. There's anti-right, there's anti-racist, which is a person who works to end racism, an activist, someone who is active. And, And that's what I was trying to be. I was reading books. I was going to rallies. I was trying to be in that group. Then there's the opposite, which is someone who is racist, who discriminates against people of a certain group, and that sort of thing. But then there's a middle group. A middle group is what most people are. Most people um, don't actively work to end racism, and most people don't work to be in the racist group. So most people are in that middle group called an assimilationist. And a simulationist doesn't actively work to end it and doesn't work to be in the racist group. So, and if you read the stamp book, there's one for young adults. Your age um, might, be a little, might be a little heavy, but middle school or high school age would be the stamp for kids. And Kwame, um, Kwame, 
So we have kids' books now, you see, who push critical race theory. And what she's trying to say, obviously she's a moron, a nitwit, uh, no doubt his tenure. What she's trying to say is most people are in the middle. That is, they are white supremacists, even though they wouldn't call themselves that. They believe in the white dominant culture, even though they wouldn't even claim to recognize it. Where they continue to support through their passivity and their acquiescence, if not their energetic support, uh, a white dominant culture. That's what she's trying to say. Because that's what they teach. Now, a professor of education at Berkeley, we've not been able to track down the name of this guy or this person. Um, but maybe playing it all help. So this is a professor of education at Berkeley. And I've told you that, of course, colleges and universities are loaded with this poison. But particularly the departments of education and journalism, they really focus on those because they understand the influence that education and journalism has on a society and a people. But listen to this. Go. My recent understanding is that to abolish whiteness is to abolish white people. Okay? Now, that's, that's different from white bodies. Right? White bodies will still exist, but we will no longer consider them white people. I'll get into this a little more. But I'm trying to distinguish between whiteness, an ideology, white people, an identity, and white bodies, which is some kind of literal understanding there that then we graft the meaning of white people onto. Right? But if you undercut whiteness as an ideology, one that a lot of the abolitionists suggest is parasitic, right? and it's an ideology that white people really depend on. But if we give white people an option out of that, and it's not just sort of words, right? It's sort of structural transformations. Um, then what I'm suggesting is that it also signals the withering away of white people. The withering away of white people. You see, he's a Marxist. And what he's saying there is, you can be black, you can be brown, you can be red, you can be yellow, you can be white. The problem is this, not the white body so much as the white mindset the white culture, the white laws, the white society. So this is what needs to be abolished. It's an ideology. It's a white man's ideology. That's what needs to be abolished. So how do you abolish it? Well, obviously Marxism. A structural transformation. You hear Biden talk about the same thing, and his spokespeople talk about the same thing, and Democrats on the Hill. We need an economic transformation Obama, fundamental transformation. It's all out of the same script, ladies and gentlemen, which is what I've been trying to say now for a long, long time and have written about. But this is the crap that's being taught in our colleges and universities and the crap that's now being taught in our government schools that you pay so dearly for and that those of you who can't afford alternatives where you have to work at home and you can't homeschool, you're sending your kids into this, uh, into this meat grinder just as uh, it happens with colleges and universities. And I'm hoping the book American Marxism and others are the, uh, provide the antithesis, provide the anti-Marxism, the anti-critical race theory, the anti-genderism, the anti-degrowth movement uh, with, uh, with ideas and arguments and an understanding of what's taking place here. But you just listen to this idiocy. Listen to this concoction of, of babble. Uh, and then, oh, he's smart. He must be a professor. He's not smart. He's an idiot. But it's more than that. This is diabolical. This is diabolical. So you had the one teacher who uh, was doing her best to explain critical race theory to the class. And then you have this professor who is, uh, who's trying to explain that uh, whiteness is an ideology, you see. It's an ideology. Whiteness is an ideology. And you'll understand all this. It's all in, uh, in American Marxism in, in, uh, in great detail. And you'll understand where it comes from, too. I'm trying to see what chapter it is. Chapter 4. 
Chapter 4, which is uh, 58 pages long, so it's a significant chapter. Racism, genderism, and Marxism. Uh, Very, very important chapter. When I was uh, out in California one one or two Fridays ago, accepting an award from the Pacific Research Institute, which really was scheduled for two years ago, um, Professor... uh, came to me and he said uh, chapter 4 is my favorite chapter that's the chapter I started that was Charles Kessler, a good friend of mine I'll be right back AMAC, the Association of Mature American Citizens is one of the fastest growing organizations in America, now over 2 million conservative members strong and I'm one of them AMAC believes in and stands up for the values that we constitutional conservatives care about. More than talk, AMAC fights. A full-time presence in Washington, AMAC pushes back against reckless spending, disasters like Medicare for All, and the expanding reach of the federal government. And beyond advocacy, joining AMAC gives you access to a wealth of benefits and discounts, including special member-only rates on car insurance, travel discounts, cell phone plans, and a hell of a lot more. And if that's not enough, you'll get AMAC's bi-monthly magazine full of insightful articles on issues that matter to most of us, we conservatives. As I said, I'm an AMAC member, and you should be too. Join today at amac.us. That's A-M-A-C dot U-S. Stop supporting the liberal agenda that the other 50-plus organization has been pushing for. Join AMAC instead. A-M-A-C dot U-S. If the world seems so confusing, Mike will be glad to clear that up for you. Call him now at 877-381-3811. This should give you a little bit of hope. This link was just sent to me, and I pulled it up, and I put it on uh, Getter and Parler. Amazon's bestsellers of 2021 so far. Remember, my book came out, I think it was June, wasn't it, Mr. Producer? Yeah, June. Maybe it was July. I don't remember. By far, American Marxism. Number two, a book called Atomic Habits. Number three, The Four Agreements. Uh, Number four is a novel. Number five is a novel. Number six is a kid's book. Number seven is a kid's book. Number eight is a novel. Number nine is a novel. Number 10 is a kid's book. Number 11 is a kid's book. Number 12 looks like an adult comic book. Number 13 is a novel. Number 14 is a novel. Number 15 is a Dr. Seuss book. Number 16 is Power, The 48 Laws of Power. Number 17, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. That book goes on forever. Number 18, 1984. Same with that one. Number 19, Five Love Languages. Big book. Number 20, a kid's book. Number 21, novel. Number 22, Peril. Bob Woodward's book, Robert Costa, is a loser book for the amount of money, no doubt, that they were paid. The book that tried to take out Trump, like so many of them, people are sick of books like that. So that book did very, very poorly overall. Number 23, a novel. Number 24, a novel. So you get the drift. You get the drift. It is extremely rare for a nonfiction book, and I mean not an autobiography or biography on a fairly famous person, but a nonfiction, straight up book on philosophy, on modern events, as well as activism. It's all three. Would go as far as American Marxism has because of you. It is the best selling book in 2021. Number two is not even close. And there won't be any book that's close. Now, I won't win any book awards from all these book associations because I'm sure they hate my guts and I'm sure they hate this book and the title of the book. We won't win any plaudits from the propaganda media and we won't even get many plaudits from, uh, from our conservative colleagues. It doesn't matter. Your impact is enormous. You're under the radar right now. People can see what's going on here and there. But they don't know how many of you are really focused and engaged. From all walks of life. Truckers, Uber drivers, Lyft drivers, taxi drivers, bus drivers. 
plumbers, electricians. We've heard from everybody, construction workers, roofers, lawyers, doctors, nurses, janitors, teachers, police officers. All walks of life, professors, are consuming this. All walks of life. Biden said he was going to unify the country. I think you're unifying the country. You're unifying the opposition to this tyranny. And I can't tell you how proud I am of you. I can't tell you how proud I am of you. You know, Rush used to say to me, always respect your audience. I've told you this. Always respect your audience. Don't talk down to your audience. Don't take your audience for granted. Don't use your audience for your own promotion and so forth. Treat your audience with respect the way you want to be treated. And I've done that every single day I've been behind this microphone broadcasting to you. I never underestimate your intelligence because you're smart. I don't care if you're Highly educated, I don't care if you dropped out of high school. They're smart and they're smart. And you're smart. When you want to take time to listen to this show, parts of the country in the middle of the night, or dinner time, other parts, drive time, when you could be doing a thousand other things, you're smart. You're engaged. And I'm blessed that we have an army of patriots like you out there. I truly am. And we're blessed by each other. And we sure as hell do miss our friend Rush, don't we? That's not to put anybody down in the least. I like everybody. But, you know, just, he was the greatest. No question about it. Why don't we have a positive clip here? With Governor DeSantis of Florida. This guy knows how to run a state. He knows how not to be pushed around. At a press conference today, he's saying, hey guys, you know, we have great ports throughout the state of Florida. Why don't you use ours a little bit more with this supply chain issue? Well, I can only imagine that the Biden administration doesn't want to use Florida. Can't you, ladies and gentlemen? Doesn't want to use Texas either. And they're so petty and evil. I don't put it past them. Cut 17, go. We in Florida uh, have the ability uh, to help alleviate these log jams and help to ameliorate the problems with the supply chain. And part of it is because we've long been committed to reliable, modern, and accessible port facilities. Since I became governor in 2019, uh, we've allocated almost a billion dollars to over 70 Florida seaport projects. And uh, these are... Uh, approaches that have have made us uh, really, really strong. And, of course, the the port is one. And then once it gets off the port uh, with the different operations that we offer, both rail and road, uh, it really, really, really is, um, I think, a model uh, for for the rest of the country. So we're here. We have capacity. And not only that, uh, I'm proud to announce, and I'm going to let the directors talk a little bit more, uh, that that Jack's Port and some of the other ports – Uh, are also stepping up even above and beyond uh, by offering incentive packages to businesses who want to move their cargo uh, through these ports, like Jacksport. Uh, This will make a huge difference. If you think about a place like Jacksport, you have close to 100 million consumers that live within one day's drive of Jacksport. Jacksport, Jacksonville. Well, why not, ladies and gentlemen? Why isn't that on Joe Biden's list or Buttigieg's list? Because it's Florida. Florida is a state that works. Florida has a serious governor and legislature. The people of Florida are free. The people are fleeing New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, even Virginia, Maryland, and they're heading to Florida. People in California are fleeing. They're heading to Texas and Tennessee and Florida. And... This is why Biden wants to turn Texas and Florida blue. 
because then they know we have no hope of ever winning the Electoral College, which, of course, they oppose because it's racist, like everything else is racist. But, of course, the Democrat Party is the biggest racist entity in the United States and always has been. But that said, they have ports, several big ports. Port of Miami is another one. And other ports in, uh, in Florida. They have a very big port in Texas. Um, a big port in Georgia. And um, Biden doesn't want to use these ports. Doesn't want to use the ports in Florida. They don't even mention it. Notice the media don't mention it because the media just regurgitate whatever Biden and his flunkies uh, burp up, pretty much. But there's the governor saying, our ports are modern. We've put a billion dollars into them over the last two years since I've been governor. Uh, the trucks, the truckers have, uh, have wonderful access to them. We have a very modern and extensive uh, highway system here in the state of Florida. We can go all the way up and down the East Coast. We can hit the, uh, the Southeast very, very easily. As he pointed out, the Jacksport, the Jacksonville port, 100 million people live within a relatively close parameter of that port. So why 100 freighters sitting off the shore of the port of L.A. and the port of Long Beach? 100 freighters. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. And the federal government can't think of any other ports? Now, let me ask you folks a question. If you were president of the United States, and you knew there were 100 freighters sitting off the coast, the west coast, of basically two ports, L.A. and Longport, would you not have your staff pulled together all the ports in the United States, the biggest ports, the most modern ports, the ports that could handle a lot more of this freight? You've got the port of Baltimore, too. Wouldn't you say, let's get these, at least for now, let's get these freighters, let's move them around the other side of the country? Or any new freighters coming? Let's send them toward the East Coast. Or the Southeast. Or Florida, to be specific. Wouldn't you do that? Of course you would. But they won't. Because they're owned by the uh, unions. And, uh, and they don't give a crap about you. Let's just be honest. The Washington Post, they, there was an op-ed today that basically said, hey, get used to it. What's wrong with you? By people who don't live paycheck to paycheck and people who have no connection, no connection with the working people of this country. That's what we're up against. I'll be right back. Mark Lovin. AMAC, the Association of Mature American Citizens, is one of the fastest growing organizations in America. Now over 2 million conservative members strong, and I'm one of them. AMAC believes in and stands up for the values that we constitutional conservatives care about. More than talk, AMAC fights. A full-time presence in Washington, AMAC pushes back against reckless spending, disasters like Medicare for All, and the expanding reach of the federal government. And beyond advocacy, joining AMAC gives you access to a wealth of benefits and discounts, including special member-only rates on car insurance, travel discounts, cell phone plans, and a hell of a lot more. And if that's not enough, you'll get AMAC's bi-monthly magazine full of insightful articles on issues that matter to most of us, we conservatives. As I said, I'm an AMAC member, and you should be too. Join today at amac.us. That's A-M-A-C dot U-S. Stop supporting the liberal agenda that the other 50-plus organization has been pushing for. Join AMAC instead. A-M-A-C dot U-S. All right, let us go to uh, William Alexandria, Virginia, the great WMAL. William, go right ahead, please. Mark Levin, I'll be quick. How you doing, brother? It's great to talk to you. Thank I'm the you. guy who at the uh, library out in Reagan, I gave you the copy of the American Citizens Handbook. And, oh, uh, thank I, I do remember thank you. you. I don't know what we would do. Yeah, I don't know what we would do without you. I want to thank your family. I want to especially thank Julie. I want to thank Adnan, the guy who told me to listen to you. I want to thank John and Ann from Huntsville, Alabama, who told me to be involved. 
And just really quickly, I'll say, because I'll be quick, um, the, the Marxists know that this is it. That's why they're flooding the border. And uh, this is a takeover. That's why they're doing all this stuff. They'll lie, mm-hmm. they'll cheat, they'll do what they have to do. And for women, and I'm Afro-American or or American of African descent, they use all these manipulation things against us. For women, they use abortion. For us, they, before it was reparations, before you haven't heard anything about it. And I just want to say two things. Uh, if you use racism and sexism to manipulate people, what does that make you? A racist and a sexist. Mm-hmm. And if only white people have the power to be racist, uh, doesn't that, uh, by definition, make them superior? And I don't believe that anybody is superior. But if only they have a power that no one else has, wouldn't that make them superior? And the last thing before I get off, um, I did use Pure Talk, and I used it when I was out there. My bill, uh, I won't say that the carrier went from 105 to uh, $60 a month, Amazing. and it's been fantastic. And I also signed up for ESPN, uh, Ex- uh, uh, Express VPN, and that's working fantastic. And also Listen to you, man. You better watch out. The backstabbers are really – Paul Ryan, Mitch McConnell, and Lindsey Graham. Because if we can't have our own people take care of us, who do we have? Those By the way, the- I want everybody to know, William flew all the way to the Reagan Library from Alexandria. William, I want to thank you very, very much, my friend. You're really a good man. You're just a tremendous patriot. And God bless you, brother. God bless you. What a good guy. Howard, San Diego, XM Satellite, the other end of the country. Howard, how are you, sir? I am great. I've seen you several times at the Reagan uh, Library for the book signing. I am the guy that, uh, in honor of my father, was uh, wearing the New York Yankee hat, and you told me to lose it, if you remember. remember. (laughs) Oh, thank you, sir. But but remember, what I'm calling for real quick is uh, uh, I'm following your advice on American Marxism. Today, I sent a three-page detailed FOIA request to the Department of Justice on the Merrick Garland conflict uh, of interest. Beautiful. And in, including including citing the regs uh, and uh, that uh, deal with their ethical violations, I attached a copy uh, of the uh, uh, detailed letter sent by uh, Senators uh, uh, Cruz, uh, Lee, uh, Lee, Pauline and, and so forth. Uh, yep. yes. So, um, you know, we're well, Howard, perfect job. Now they're going to push back. You just keep pursuing it. And uh, I think this is great. I wish a thousand people in the audience would do exactly the same thing. We should overwhelm them. We should use our own, uh, Cloward and Piven. But Howard, I want to thank you, my friend. And it was, it was great seeing you. I certainly do remember who you are. Let's move quickly. Tim, Dallas, Texas, the WBAP, excuse me, WBAP. Go right ahead, Tim. Hey, Mark. It's another uh, honor and privilege to talk to you, sir. I greatly appreciate it. Thank you. Um, Mark, you may remember me. The, uh, I, I, I talked to you the night before your book was released. Um, you may recall me. I'm a packer at Amazon. Oh, I do. You, you know, said was... you got tons of these books you're sending out. Oh, yeah. I got so many of your books that I was packing. I was just so overjoyed and happy with it. And I'll make the, this story really quick. Um, Ten seconds. Yeah. I, uh, I, but that book, um, that book, Peril, it doesn't sell. I packed one ever since it came out. Never saw another one. <laughs> Tim, call again, my brother. Appreciate all you folks. God bless you all. You're just terrific. And we salute all you heroes, and I'll see you tomorrow. Be well. Be well.